you and uh, dear Republic and dear Culture West, thank you for inviting me again. This is actually the third time I'm here in Gothenburg and I get to talk to you fine people. Uh, I've been here before talking about audience development in theory. I've been talking about audience development in practice. And this time I'd like to focus on the changes that we see in the sector now and what leadership I think is needed. Um, I'm the first speaker, and I'd very much like to say that I'm not going to provide you with answers. I'd like to share some reflections. Um, I saw in the program a quite scary sentence. It said that, for decades, Christian Danielson has been an integral voice, so-and-so. And that made me think two thoughts immediately. One is that, oh my god, I'm getting old. <laughs> decades. You know, not decade, decades. Secondly, it made me think that you people might think I'm some sort of genius, that I've sort of worked it all out, and you've come here to listen to me to get the answers. Well, you're not going to get that. I'd like this to be um, a conversation starter, so that my talk will have suggestions, and I'll share some reflections, and I'll be happy to discuss it further with you. Uh, I learned this in England, that we're all enlightened amateurs, that we do our best. But I think my force has been that I'm curious and that I contain to be curious. So, also, if some of you have heard me before and thinking, oh no, not her again, I'll try and share some new reflections. Is this working? No, it's not. Should I point it in a direction? Help? <laughs> you see, I'm not a genius at all. I can't even figure out a PowerPoint. Maybe that. Is someone coming rushing now to help me out? Okay. Anyway, I'll continue why I have some technical staff desperately trying to help me here. Uh, I decided to call this talk, Are We Still in the Arts Business? Um, I'd like to share some of my background with you. I was uh, educated a dancer many, many years ago, decades ago. Uh, and then I turned into a management student. I went to City University and I did my degree in arts administration. So I turned academic, project manager, entrepreneur, I've run my own agency, and now director, sort of queen of public diplomacy. Thank you very much. So, I'd like to say one, of the, one or two things about what I've learned during these years. Since I was educated in the UK, obviously audience development was at the core of everything that we did. So, I was trained to always put the end user at the very centre of what I'm doing. But when I got back to Norway in 1999, decades ago, sorry, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> I realized that some of the institutions still had a conversation going on quality, high quality, autonomy, and slightly wrapped into their own bubble in the arts discourse, which is very scary, and I'll, I'd like to share some thoughts on that. So I went in search for soulmates. I, find, I found a lot of people that are in this room, people working with Audiences Norway, people working with Audiences Sweden, and I also met a person called Lisa Baxter. She runs a company called The Experience Business in the UK, and she said, well, audience development is very easy. It's about putting audiences at the center of what you do, always, and to realize that we're not about something. We are for somebody. And that sounds very easy but it is very difficult to actually implement. But that became my ethos, and I was really inspired by her. And I'd like to share a case with you in the Dijkmanske Library, where I was a director up until two months ago, because it's an interesting case with libraries. Libraries in a digital age, do we still need them? And in Dijkman, this is where I really could practice to be about uh, to be for somebody instead of being about something, being for people and not about books. So this is where I really learned that you always have to start asking the main question, which is why? Because whatever you do, whatever arts institution that you run, people don't really come to you because of what you do or what your production is. You think so. 
And we spend all our conversations programming for next year. What are we going to put on? What is it that we're going to show them? The thing is, people come to you because of why you do it. Because our institutions, they are very different, but they have more or less the same aims and objectives. And we can discuss that for hours. But it's about critical reflection, it's about finding a higher meaning, it's about learning, it's about getting a time out, but it's about why. So what I did in Dijkman, this is me, with a little bit of longer hair and also with a broken foot, I went ice skating over Christmas. And the title here is that the library is not about books, we're about people. Because traditionally, arts organizations, they focus on their content and their collections very often. Museums and libraries share that. But that's not really enough anymore. So in Dijkman, we created what we call the value zone, which means that our institution does not exist unless someone is in contact with our content. And that also sounds very easy, but it's actually a little bit hard to do. So if we're, not lo if we're no longer about books, what are we about? And then we went on a journey trying to figure out a new strategy. And that obviously started with the question, why libraries? In Dijkmanski Library, we're 250 employees, and I speed dated each and every one of them, and I asked them the same question. And I said, why do we need libraries in a digital age? And that was really hard for them, because they went on about the importance of reading, the importance of democracy, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, that's all well and fine, but why do we really need libraries? And some of them said to me, oh, it's so hard. You're asking me about the meaning of life. And I said, yes, very good. Answer that one. And this, this is what we came up with, which I think is pretty good, because it's about the effect of libraries. It's not about the institution, but it's about what the, the libraries actually are all about, the outcome of libraries. And it's pretty, what you call it, hairy. You know, it's pretty ambitious, isn't it? At least the first sentence, libraries widens our horizon and change lives. Who? Change lives? Well, actually, we do. On an everyday basis, libraries change lives. It's very simple, so why not say it? The social aim of libraries is to promote knowledge, show connections, and promote critical reflection. Critical reflection is not getting less important as people are getting smarter and smarter. Someone mentioned the election tomorrow. I think critical reflection is more important than ever. So in a library, by offering media experiences and arenas for co-creations, libraries inspire people to take part in society and to take part in their lives. And this last sentence is really hairy because we say that a city with good libraries is a city with unique meeting spaces. And they actually build trust between people. Trust is another thing that's not really a common good anymore. If we look at buildings, public buildings, and how they build security levels, libraries are still open, and it's about trusting. So this is the journey that we made at the library, where I was the director, and I said we need to focus on why before we focus on what. So before we buy books, before we hire people, before we decide to set up a program, we need to know why. So what is the institution, a library? What are they about today? Well, it's obviously about reading. It's an everlasting challenge, and it's gone from nice to have to must, must have. There's no way you can handle life anymore if you can't read. It's also about being able to express yourself. We see the change now in society where the have-nots are in an increasing number. So you can see a public discourse with people from the families of those who have education, of those who have funds. Arts institutions and libraries should pick up everyone outside that discourse and give them a chance too. And it's about creation. It's about co-creation. Uh, the makerspace movement I find very interesting. Why is that interesting for an art institution? Well, uh, their slogan is hack reality. And that's critical reflection for you. That's about opening all the digital tools that you're so addicted to and dependent on in your everyday and ask questions about how it works. And finally, perhaps the most important, it's about being together. It's about togetherness. In a world where we see an increase 
in focusing on differences, where they want to build walls to stop people from migrating, we see a huge change, which is a huge challenge for all of us working in the arts. And I'd just like to say, coexistence is our only option. And art institutions have a very special uh, ansvar, responsibility, thank you, for doing that. And I think we need to go from building cultural capital to building social capital. So, my mentioning now is from a library case, but I think it's universal to arts organizations. Having great collections, great programs, great artists is fine, but it's how you use it that's really interesting. And remember that we are for somebody, we're not about something. And this sounds easy, doesn't it? It sounds easy just to implement this, because we all agree. If we look at statistics, audience statistics, we see that we have to change. The problem is that there is so much resistance to change. It's very hard to change. We don't like change. And if I had all of you raising your hands now, when did you last do something you have never done before? Even if you're innovators and in the art scenes, very few of you would actually raise your hand because we tend to do the same things again and again. And if you want to change an art institution, the changes that we see now, they're 20, 30 years old, but the traditions of an arts institution, they go 100 years back, hundreds of years back. So if you're a change maker in the arts organization and in arts institutions, you're up against pretty stiff competition. But that's, for me, what cultural leadership is about. You have to be, a strat uh, you have to be strategically thinking about the changes in the environment where your art institution is placed. And you have to, one way or the other, make your organization walk with you in the same direction. And to see the world as it is and not the way it used to be. And that's very hard. And if we, if we do business as usual, as Henrik said, that's the best way to die. That's the best way to become a Kodak. You remember Kodak? They actually invented the digital camera, but they said, nah, I don't think that's going to fly. You know? And that's what leadership is about. Uh, I'd like to share with you some of the tendencies that you're not going to see. There you go. Some of the tendencies that I've seen over the years that I think are interesting at the moment is that in the culture sector, it used to be sort of the high, highbrow art and then the commercial art. Now everything is allowed, at least from a Norwegian perspective, when you see uh, the budgets to culture, Everything is allowed, and I think it's a good thing, but it, ne it means that we need to navigate a little bit anew. We've seen experts die. We see newspapers losing track because people go to Facebook instead. We see people not trusting politicians. We see people not trusting institutions. So we see that old experts die, and they die very quickly. So now we go to do it yourself. The digitalization also in the arts business made it very easy to produce uh, specifically movies or music. So we're all experts now. But of course, we're not all experts. We need to take it into account. It used to be so easy because we used to be the experts, but it's not like that anymore. And it's also gone from, yes, art is important naturally, to people asking, why, really? And we have to be able to answer that question. It's gone from autonomous and holy that we can sort of work in our own bubble into being an investment or a creative industry. It's gone from institutions and set venues at 8 p.m. We go to concerts or the movies, where consumers now want to do everything all the time, everywhere. So you please my need if you want me to consume your cultural product. Uh, we've gone from collection, quality, it says, <laughs> and discourse to user-centered and to co-creation. We've gone from being about something to be for somebody. And how are we going to navigate in that? And you know, like I said, I don't have the answer, but I think we have some cases that are interesting to look at. Um, moving swiftly on. I'd like to share this example with you. 
Because I'm no longer now a director of an arts organization. There is no direct audience at the Arts Council of Norway. We are now um, we're administering a lot of money and we're supporting art projects. But I don't see the audience anymore. So how on earth is I'm, am I going to take all this experience with me into the Arts Council? Well, it's the same thing, really. We have to ask why. It's the same question always. And I think this case from the Arts Council of England is pretty interesting. This is the first page. If you go to artscouncil.co.uk, you see this. Why do art and culture matter? Wow, it's a pretty heavy question. Usually arts councils, they're very loaded, dense web pages with, you know, I think in our website there's actually a picture of a bag of money because that's what we're all about, you know? And I think it's interesting. We have to go back and look at why. I think the answer and what they've, what, what they've written also is interesting. We believe that art and culture make life better, help to build diverse communities and improve our quality of life. Great art and culture can inspire our education system, boost our economy and give our nation international standing. As simple as that. Again, it's about it's not about power and money in an arts council, but it's about the outcome, the effect and the results of what all these grants actually go to. I think uh, I'd like to, this, I'll go pretty quickly. No, that was too quick. <laughs> I'd like to share this with you. Um, what's on my agenda? If I'm going to take my decades of experience into the Arts Council of Norway, I'm going to ask the same question again. Why do we need a cultural policy? Why do we need the Arts Council? And why actually do we have arts and culture to begin with? We have to answer these questions and we have to do it again and again. Arts councils all over the world, they have a very heavy position. People listen to what we say, we have power. But we need to move on to become a function. We need to make sure that we're actually needed. We also have a huge discourse now, which I know you have in Sweden, about regionali regionalization. I can't even say that word. Regionalisering. I'll say, yeah, you know that word. <laughs> we used to have national touring agencies, national film agencies, national uh, riksutstillinger, national companies, Everything was produced in Oslo and then we sent it out touring and all was fine. But now we have strong regions, which is brilliant. But then, what is actually the state level? Why do we need a national policy? Why do we need a national arts council? This is a really interesting discussion that we're standing right in the middle of, both in Sweden and Norway, and we need to have some good answers to that. I also do believe that we are still in the arts business. I'm going, to answer, I'm going to finalize this by answering my own question, that are we still in the arts business? Yes, we are, but we're very much in the people business. If we don't realize that whatever we produce and that whatever we create, it's actually for an end user out there, there's very little value in what we do. And I do strongly believe in building social capital and not only cultural capital. Cultural policies, as we know them in the Nordic countries, there. I uh, just wanted to make sure that you're all awake. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a post war phenomenon. In 1945, arts councils were established around the world to build the new society, to build new values. It's all based on the German word Bildung. We wanted to educate people, and then everything would be fine. The thing is that we are built now. There is so much information flowing everywhere and you can't sit and be an expert anymore because experts are everywhere. So we're sort of halfway through what we need to do. Secondly, now we really need to focus on building social meeting places between people. If you have some sort of statistic, try and figure out what your next generation are actually doing on their spare time. We know the answer, don't we? We spend 40% less time with social activities than what we did 20 years ago. Kids spend two hours per day less with social activities and more in screen activities. And I think screens are great, and I'm a very much a digital optimist, but I do believe in the conversation live with people. And I think if arts institutions really can take that responsibility in, I think that's a very good idea, and now is the time to start doing that. 
And one final thing uh, I said here in, in really bad English, I think. I think I've in, invented some words that don't exist, but arts institutions really have to support the creative, inefficient, empathic, is that a word? Disruptive, non-logical human intelligence. Why? Because of this. Because we're in a time now where a lot of our jobs will be solved by robots. Which is a good thing, because we get more time on our hands. But what is it that a robot cannot do? I'm not sure, because they can do a lot of things. But they cannot reflect upon being human. Only humans can reflect upon being humans. And that's what we are really good at in the art sector. So let's use that now as a unique selling point, as they say, as our USP, in order to make sure that for the next 50, 100 years, arts organizations will still be relevant and needed in society. And then I have this really beautiful picture, because I don't think a robot can still do that, that originally. OK, and it says zero, so I'm right on time, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. She will sit down and uh, Chris Torch will come up. I will first say that uh, we can use post Wi Fi home run.